The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome into Views from the Sideline. I'm Joey Tysick. That's Malik Hill. And uh, we got a lot to talk about today. There's college football bowl games happening as we speak. More coming up this weekend with the big New Year's Day bowls going on. Um, We have some unfortunate Detroit news and some fortunate Detroit news. On the complete, I don't think it's been a time like this in Detroit sports history. Yeah. Where it's like the complete end of the spectrum on both sides. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Two of our, well, all the Detroit teams are popular, I guess, so I can't really say anything. But we'll start off with the Pistons. They did it. Continue losing. Bravo. They broke the record for single season loss. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's just this single season. If they lose one more, it'll be the most losses in a row ever in the NBA. I believe the Sixers lost 28 in a row, and it technically spanned two seasons. Um, But the Pistons have lost 27 in a row. Who could have imagined at the start of this season? They started 2-1. and Yeah. After that Bulls win. They looked like they were going to do something. Pistons fans were pretty excited for a fun young team. Yeah. We we had some hope. I don't know if anybody – Chris probably expected playoffs or play-in, but I expected to be better than last year. And that's all I could have asked for. 30 wins was all I expected. Yeah. 30. The Pistons are the worst team in the NBA by far. They're the worst shooting team in the NBA by far. Um, And they have a lot of problems. We talked about it a little bit before. um, But now they've they've hit the pinnacle. Cade Cunningham has been playing pretty good, actually. He put up 41 last night. Um, And they just, they can't get it done. I don't know. They looked competitive last night. They had a chance to win the game. They went up by 14 points in the first quarter and then blew it and then lost the lead at halftime and then had a chance late in the game. And then just as you write it up, Cade has a chance to maybe make a game winning play or game tying play, bounce it as off his knee turnover. And then uh, Brooklyn misses a couple free throws. Pistons get the ball back for maybe some miracle chance. And I can't remember who it is. If it was Bagley or Sp- Beef Stew that tries to throw it to Jaden Ivey, who's not looking, and it goes out of bounds. Turnover, game over. Um, it was just ugly the way that it ended. Um, the Pistons lost to the Jazz a couple weeks ago, I think. Yeah, they lost to, j- to the Jazz's like, second team. Yeah. Basically, they lost to the Jazz's second team at home. And they were that was like the only game they've been favored in, although yeah. I easily took the money line in that bet because the Jazz were without Lori Markin in. Um, and a couple others, but they still had Walker Kessler, uh, Kelly Olenek, who loves to torch the Pistons since he's been traded, um, Colin Sexton, who I think people forget about. Listen, you got some Fontecchio. Who doesn't yeah. love some Fontecchio? Yeah. Oce Abaji. Who, who knows Fontecchio outside of like I don't know two percent of NBA fans? Yeah. Um. So it's just it's just a disaster right now, and I think we mentioned it before, like. I think everybody should be on the table to be traded or fired for the most part. Um, I think at this point, Troy Weaver's got to go. Monty Williams, I don't know what to do with that. We paid the man top dollar. Um, The biggest move, money move you've made in the past few years. Yeah. And it's a coach. Has led to this. Um, We can't, Tom Gores can't be fired. Yeah. So, even though everybody wants him to sell the team, mm-hmm. like we, we just gotta. I, I I don't know. Yeah. What do we do? What do we do? I don't know. As fans of the Detroit Pistons, I'm starting to get drastic. Mm-hmm. If they move the Pistons to Vegas, I don't think I'd care. No, I don't want them to move the franchise. But we saw an incredible era of Pistons basketball. Yeah. And I at this point at this point. 
this level of embarrassment, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be mad if they just went away. Wow. At least for maybe like the Cleveland Browns. Get them away for like five or six years. I don't want to see the Pistons play basketball <laughs> for a while. Wow. Listen, I'm, I'll be 30 in a few years. Let me get into my 30s, and then we can see the Pistons again. Ugh. Maybe I'll, I'll be more adjusted Man. to seeing them again. Because hmm. so this know. ain't it. Yeah. This is not it. Are there any redeeming factors to this team? Cade. Okay. But even that turns negative when you realize he won't be here in a few years. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they might pay him. But you do you think he's gonna you think he's not gonna request a trade? Yeah, I, I would assume so. And yeah. Jalen Duran is a big positive, but he hasn't played a ton. Yeah. So who knows what his health in the future will look like. Right. He's the only one that I think I want to hold on to right now because I don't think that his his value is as high because of the injuries lately. Um I know a lot of people want to keep Cade. I would like to keep Cade, but he also has the most value on this team right now. So like He's going to be the biggest trade piece if we try to do anything. Like yeah. People are like, oh, well, Bojan will garner something for a championship caliber team. Yeah, but they know that we're desperate at this point, and so it's not that great. We don't have great leverage, I guess. Yeah. I, I also think they're, they're in the process or have already killed several future careers of young players. Mm. I, th- I don't think Jaden Ivey can be his self again until he leaves yeah. Detroit. Or if they just completely reshape every everything the way it is, because mm-hmm. he still has good games, but it's clear that he's he's not himself. Yeah, it it just it's it's all time bad. Yeah, and it seemed that. <sighs> Here, do you want to switch mics real quick? I'm getting a little bit of a okay ring. I turned is on. Is it four. still? Oh yeah, yeah. I turned it on. Um, but yeah, like the Pistons are just, uh, it's awful right now because they're in, they're in like NBA purgatory where I don't know Four. what they can do. Yeah. yeah, I got it. Um, because I, like, I get that people don't like Joe Harris, but when your team is a 33% three point shooting team, maybe you should just throw him out there. Maybe he'll hit some shots. Maybe I haven't get... watched a Pistons game since like the third week of the season. I haven't. So either. I couldn't even tell you what they look like outside yeah. of Cade playing well. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't see. Much I don't. Either. What does this team? I don't know. Outside of losing, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. Yep. That's why I said they need to rebuild it from the top down. Troy Weaver needs to go. Probably a bunch of other front office guys that I don't know about need to go. Um, Everybody has a hand in what has happened. Yeah. Exactly. No, they, don't, nobody. None of their moves yeah, have worked out. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, the pick and Killian hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. The Wiseman Sadiq Bay trade Looks has awful. become a disaster. Yeah. One of the worst modern trades, I think, in NBA history. Mm-hmm. Sadiq Bay is a quality player on a playoff team. Yeah. For the rest of his career. Mm hmm. He instantly became that once he left. Yeah. And was, we have a young center that can't play basketball. Mm-hmm. He, he really, he's not good. Yeah. Can we, can we try to end it on the silver lining that you, that could be possible that you pointed out? It oh, might not, it might yeah. not even happen, but okay. there are parallels and similarities to the situation Yeah, between this and the late nineties Pistons. Yeah, they were also searching, and didn't know what was they were gonna do in the future. Yeah, I, I did see a light of hope at the end of the tunnel when uh, on Twitter last night it was circulating when they showed Cade coming, Cade having forty one points, that he's like the first Piston to have like three forty point games or something along those lines since Jerry Stackhouse. Now Jerry Stackhouse, famous Piston. Played really well here. Also, all-star level player. Mm-hmm. Very good player. Not a superstar. Right. But very talented and had those games where he put up serious numbers. Right. Um, never fully turned into that superstar, even when he uh, left the Pistons. Yeah. But, turned into a quality role player on several teams. But we did trade Jerry Stackhouse for a young Rip Hamilton 
way back when, not too long yeah. after um, those stats. And I, that th- I think was- the, I think the one person that was there with him was Ben Wallace. Ben yeah. was Ben was there. Yeah, for when like Jerry the was first there or and, second year. Yeah. yeah, and once they traded Jerry, that's when they started mm-hmm. figuring things out. Yeah, and I believe I might be wrong, but part of the Grant Hill stuff. Part of the Grant Hill led stuff to led ben to Ben Wallace. Wallace. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's the case. So the Pistons traded two of their biggest players. Grant Hill, granted. Everybody out. thought he was the next Jordan. And he probably could have been. Yeah. Injuries aside. But we traded basically two potential superstars at the time because we were such a bad team that two, led yeah, to a dynasty. That nobody... Yeah. Yeah. Nobody saw what they would become. Mm -hmm. Ben Wallace, kind of a lost soul, filled in, became a monster. Rip Hamilton, he's a little different. I think he was one that had a lot of potential going into it. um, He was averaging close to 20 in Washington, but yeah, yeah, they couldn't find a real fit for him. Yep. And then not too long after, they found Chauncey Billups, another kind of lost soul. Drafted Drafted Tayshawn. Tayshawn. And then they needed Rashid to finish the whole core. And then. You know, the rest is obviously history. So that's my silver lining that I saw that, you know, I hate to say it, maybe we trade Cade. He's got value. I think at this point, we've seen almost his ceiling. I don't think Cade can get too much better than what we've seen. I think I think the better version of what he is right now is just efficient. Right. His best games, he has been... Incredibly efficient. Mm -hmm. I think last night he was like 16 of 23. Yeah. Like 5 of 7 from 3. 41 points and just an overall high-level game. Right. Like that. that's the high-level version of Cade. Mm -hmm. Like 50% shooting from the field, high 30s from 3, 26, 27 a game. Like that's the version of Cade. Yeah, and and the limiting turnovers. Like I think he only had 3 or 4 last night. So – yeah, I think we've kind of seen where the ceiling could be. Again, I would like, I'd rather probably not um, get rid of him just yet. But if the if the market's right, I can go for it. Um, so we'll see. But it's gonna be it's gonna be another. I hate to say three to four years of a rebuild if they yeah. fully tear it down. So we we have seen teams go from the bottom to respectability within. Three, four, five years. We're seeing it right now. With, we've mentioned it a couple times. The Timberwolves are the first seed in the West. Yeah. The Thunder are the third seed right now. The th- the Thunder are kind of different because everything Sam Presti has touched in the past 15 years has yeah. turned to gold. Mm-hmm. He's kind of different. Yeah. Every decision he makes is great. Yeah. But the Timberwolves, they drafted Anthony Edwards, mm-hmm. made the Rudy Gobert trade, which we laughed at in the moment and yeah. for, and last season. But it's working mm-hmm. great now. Traded from Mike Conley. He's a really great fit next to Anthony Edwards. Yeah. We still don't know if Cat will work out, but mm-hmm. they got Naz Reed. They got uh oh, I forgot the the six ten young kid. Like he's like a third year player. Vanderbilt? No. Or um A uh, McDaniels. Yes. Yeah. They, I always get them mixed up. They have young pieces that make sense mm-hmm. and fit together. Yeah. So it's possible, but we we just don't know what the first move is. Yeah, we don't know what's gonna happen. Right. So it's a wait and see. Hopefully, I, you know, everybody called for Tom Gores to speak out as well about it. I kind of wish he hadn't. Now, uh, his speech was lackluster, saying that they do a lot of good for the community and that blah blah blah. We get that. What more do you expect from Tom Gores? And I hate to say. A lot of teams do good for their communities. That's kind of what... I'm pretty sure almost every team does good in their... Right. That's tries to do good in their Professional communities. sports do on the side a lot. They they support their communities. But you also have to put a product out there for your business. And there's no Listen, product out there. Tom Gores is like a less aggressive James Dolan. Yeah. Dolan is like is willing to kick out fans <laughs> and, ma- and make like... Uh, Make examples of people. Mm-hmm. Tom Gores is just is just trying to show up and have fun. Yeah, and he's not a, a really a basketball mind, just like James Dolan. Right. He's here to make money off a team and yeah, yeah. be drunk on the sideline. And recently, <laughs> which he, good for him, I guess. He was 
I assume at his mansion or something talking about how we have a good young core and blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, sure. We all thought we had a good young core, but it's not working out. And when things aren't working out, no matter how you feel about it, you have to make a change because you can't just keep going through this toxic relationship with this team of like, oh, but Cade, Jaden, Jalen Duran, Asar, like that's a good core. They they can make it work. You can't, they're not yeah. they're not making it you work. You can't do the on paper stuff. Right. For and I, I get and that years. they're still young and people want to keep giving them chances, but the NBA moves fast. If yeah. windows close quickly. Yeah, and you can tell with young players if they're gonna work out pretty quickly, unfortunately. Um so I don't know. It's 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 terrible. It stinks. And we probably won't have to talk about the Pistons much more, except for how long will this go on? Their next projected time that they would be a winning uh, team is that against the Spurs, like January 10th, is their last Listen, like projected win. This is... Of the season. This is uh, not good. a good way to look at it at all. I kind of want to see how far they can take this. Like, could you imagine a team going? There, are, there are people that have put money on them going two and eighty. Yeah, <laughs> I've seen people send me messages putting five dollars on them not winning another game for the mm-hmm. rest of the season. And like a lot of analysts are starting to point out too, the problem becomes okay for a while when they were losing a lot in a row, like when you lose fifteen in a row or something. Teams have done that before, and it's like okay, we can give our guys a night off, let them rest. Oh, we're playing the Pistons; it's no big deal. Now that the Pistons have the record, nobody wants to lose to the team. Now they're getting their team's best again because they don't want to, right, exactly. They don't want to be that team that loses to the Pistons. So it's going to be a struggle now. And I don't know. I also, it's, it's hilarious to me that no team in the past 27 games has had an off night against the Pistons. Right. No matter who sits out, mm-hmm. no matter whether it's the first team, first team, second team, the coach can be sick. Teams are showing up and just playing good basketball against the Pistons. Yeah, and I, I think, when is the team going to have an off night? I think the that goes to say, like, <laughs> with their three point percentage, like the Pistons just don't shoot the ball well from three. So if a team even remotely shoots decently at a high enough clip, they can stay in a game pretty easily, even if they're having an off night. The Pistons can be up by five and down by 15 within two minutes. Yeah. So it's rough. Um, we'll probably talk about them a little bit at the trade deadline because I would assume they will they should be active. Listen, all, but All the rumors I've seen of the wannabe basketball talk accounts on social media. Yeah. I, I can't stand any, any any one of them. Yeah. I, Pascal Siakam doesn't help. Mm. None, none of these, none of it helps. Yeah. I Maybe think, Zach Levine because he can score. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. I do think uh, – I also agree, though. I've heard a lot of people mention that should should we allow Troy Weaver to have another trade deadline? No. So, like – I say no. We need to fire him before we even do a trade. Like, I don't know. It's a mess. Anyway, let's go on to the positives because the Detroit Lions have won – the NFC North for the first time ever. First time they won a division in 30 years. First time they've won and a division. And what division did they win in 1993? The, the NFC Central. Central. You know how old I am, Malik? I just turned 31. Yes. I wasn't yes. old enough to know that they won a division title in 93. I've never yeah. seen this before. I don't know how to react to it. The Lions are 11-4. and four. They have a huge game against Dallas this weekend on Saturday, which is technically Monday Night Football, which is weird. Um, if they beat Dallas, I think they're almost locked into the second seed, and they have a potential to get a one seed if somehow the 49ers blow it against Washington or yeah. they have two nothing burger games, but there's always a chance. We kind of talked about some of the crazy stuff that could happen with the Lions this season last week about, you know, some random Super Bowl appearance and all that. If they beat Dallas this weekend, how crazy are you willing to go with this team? They should make the NFC Championship. 
I think that's where I'm at, too. If they beat Dallas. Right. I still can't say they're a Super Bowl contender. Yeah. Because that defense, it just, they're scary at times and yeah. not in a good way. Mm-hmm. There are times where they make plays and there are times where they do nothing. Yeah. And they've done just enough in the last two weeks to win. They dominated Denver. Yeah. But uh, at Minnesota, they did just enough Mm -hmm. against Nick Mullins. And they needed a fourth pick to officially beat Minnesota. Right. Yeah, it took a lot. Yeah. But, again, supposedly for the playoffs, we're supposed to get C.J. Gardner-Johnson back. We're supposed to get James Houston back. I think the other one was Broderick Martin. Um. I think. I don't even know what he looks like either, in a Lions uniform. It's either Project Martin or Lee McNeil. Is Lee McNeil supposed to be back? I don't know. It would be great if they could have him back. But C.J. Gardner-Johnson and James Houston, at least, would be huge. Um, especially if they, you know, get back to how they played quickly. That's, I guess, maybe the hard part. But, yeah, I agree. I think this team getting home field advantage for the first round is huge. And now... This season is a failure if they don't win a playoff game. I don't care that they won the division. Yeah. It's exciting for right now, but this team was a potential playoff team last year. That would have been an achievement just to make the playoffs. This year is different. Just making the playoffs isn't good enough. And that's crazy to say, but it's fun to say. This team has to win their first-round matchup, no matter what. Um, otherwise, it's a failure. And if they get that second seed and they have two home games, I don't know how they would potentially lose that second game. Because then at that point, they're going to play, they would most likely play like a Dallas again or Philly. And if they've already beaten Dallas, Dallas played close with Philly. Like you start to make comparisons. Which The Cowboys are starting to do what they do every year around this time. Yeah. Look very mortal. Mm-hmm. and inconsistent yeah i don't know if you listened to uh undisputed i think it was this morning i saw some clips about it but skip bayless giving the lions a lot of credit and he's a big uh cowboys fan but he's he's nervous about the matchup mostly because it kind of doesn't matter for the cowboys they can't really change their seating at this point because they're behind the eagles and the lions have something to play for still yeah. like the lions don't have to rest their players i don't want them to rest their players um Unless maybe, well, I think we talked about it last week. Like, if they lose to Dallas and then they can't change their seating, maybe you rest your players against Minnesota. But for the meantime, they got to throw everything and the kitchen sink at these guys and hope for upping their seating. Because if the, if the, if the Lions get two home playoff games, I think they're the scariest team to play in the playoffs because that fan base is going to be crazy. We've already seen how loud they can get during the regular season. And I can't imagine a playoff game. So it's going to be fun. Do you, what do you have like a percentage or thought about like how likely they are to beat Dallas? Because the matchup is interesting. I would honestly this might sound lazy, but I would give it a 50-50 shot mm-hmm. because you don't know what Dallas team is going to show up. Right. They can show up and Dak Prescott can be like close to perfect in terms of efficiency. CeeDee Lamb can go off for over 100 yards and like two receiving touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Their defense can be scary and Micah Parsons can get like three sacks. When everything is rolling – just like in the past like 15 years of Cowboys regular season football, mm-hmm. when the Cowboys are rolling in the regular season, they are scary. Yeah. But there always comes a point, we know, there always comes a point, usually around wintertime, when the inconsistencies show up. Mm-hmm. And they've shown up. They They look really good for like two drives against Miami, and then they couldn't really figure things out on offense. Mm-hmm. Miami did just enough on offense to pull the game out. Yeah. Outside of CeeDee Lamb, I don't know what you're afraid of on the Cowboys offense. Mm. Tony Pollard, I think, is clearly showing that he's not, like, the guy Yeah. at this point. 
And I'm I'm not afraid of any running back. I think the Lions defense at this point has just proven they can stop yeah. anybody. So I'm not afraid of that. And the the way they were throwing different blitz packages at Nick Mullins yeah. last week. I really like what they did with is it Olafonwu? What what uh, how, what is Melifonwu? Like? Melifonwu. Ifitu Melifonwu. I love how they used him blitzing I, and throwing him around in different I've packages at the safety that. position. Yeah. Yeah. Giving him a different look. He's kind of playing that CJ Gardner Johnson role almost, playing kind of in the nickel. My brother and I were talking about it for a while. It'll be interesting when CJ comes back, what they're gonna do with him. But I love, yeah, I love that they're giving him like safety blitz opportunities. Yeah. And Dak Prescott has shown in the past few years that if you get the right amount of pressure in his face, mm -hmm. he is bound to make mistakes. Right. He had, his interception numbers aren't up like they were last year where he hit, was it 14, I think? Because he had like a six week span where he had one or two picks almost every week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Dak Prescott still, when he gets rattled, he either makes like a really nice play or he just makes like flat out dumb play. Yeah. And if the Lions can get enough pressure, and it's still frustrating that Aiden Hutchinson leads the NFL in quarterback pressures, but only has like five and a half sacks. Yeah. It is, I, I wonder how he can un just figure out how to match those two things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid of the Cowboys, and the Lions shouldn't be either. Right. And I'm pretty sure they won't be. Yeah. And I think it's going to be nice, too, matchup-wise, because the Lions offensive line is healthy right now. They're playing good. If they can stop Micah Parsons, give Jared Goff enough time, they don't really have a great like slot corner. So I think Amon Ra can play really well. I think it's a big Sam Laporta game. Um, like Deron Bland is going to have like Jamison Williams, maybe. Maybe if they play Josh Reynolds, I don't know. Um, so like their outside guys, who are usually their better players on their in their defensive back, um are not our strongest suit for our wide receivers. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I we saw. I also, sorry, yeah, no, go for it. I also think this is a big David Montgomery game mm -hmm. because I think he's shown throughout this season and through his career, honestly, that he's one of the better blocking backs in the league. Yeah. If he can chip Micah Parsons just in, enough times, because it's almost impossible to get a full like knockout block on Micah Parsons. Right. If he can chip him, several times and give Jared Goff that time in the pocket because the Cowboys pass rush outside of Michael, Michael Parsons mm -hmm. is close to non-existent. Right. They don't have guys to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. David Montgomery does his job out there, keeps chipping Michael Parsons. If Jared Goff has time, guys are going to get open and he's going to hit them. Yeah. So that offense gets rolling. I think David Montgomery needs to be out there a little bit more than Jameer Gibbs this, mm. this week. Or maybe you could use Gibbs in the slot. Yeah, and have him be yeah, in different packages, right? Because he's that dynamic. He can be obviously. like he can be a dump off for when there's pressure. Yeah, yeah. I think they run should, it up the middle. Give, I think they David should do Montgomery a lot those. of yeah. split back sets. Maybe I agree. Um, because I think they're gonna have to move Micah Parsons around because I think Penny Sewell and Graham Glasgow on that side have really been strong. Yeah. Um, I mean the whole line has been, but yeah, that one defensive end for Minnesota took advantage of. Who's 77? Is that Taylor Decker? It's um, not Taylor Decker, is it? I thought Taylor Decker was 76. 70, whoever 77 was, know. the defensive end for the Vikings with the dreads, mm -hmm. he was yeah, he was taking advantage of him for a lot of the game. Yeah. The other big thing, too, that I, I think people have kind of forgotten, the Cowboys are undefeated at home, and they've been blowing teams out at home. Yeah. Um, But the Lions are undefeated in primetime, so there's – that's why fifty is somebody's gonna have to 50, break it. Fifty fifty makes some sense. Yeah, and the yeah. last time that the Cowboys did play somebody, um, there was a physical running team like the Lions, was basically the Bills when James Cook ran all over them. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping that the Lions can take that and run with it, literally. So big game on Saturday. I'm I'm pretty pretty excited about it. Um, but it, if they win this game. We might be talking crazy a little bit, but I'm excited. At this point, it's not crazy. Right, no. That's the fun part. Yeah. At this point, it's not talking crazy. Mm -hmm. It's projecting, just I, just normal projecting. I think the other thing about this game, too, is it, it once again proves that the Lions are still right there as a top team. Because, once again, the Lions have you know dumped a couple games. 
They've only lost four on the season, but they dumped a couple that they should have won. And that keeps people in doubt for this Lions team. The Lions are six point underdogs in this game, which seems wild to me. Um, but it just shows that people just, they don't believe yet. So I think this would be another big game to get people to believe because Dallas is America's team. So Lions, please go out there, prove yourselves so we can get some hype going into the playoffs. Fun times, man. Yeah. Fun times. It is. What's not fun times is it's a perfect segue to talk about NFL picks. We're not doing them this week, Malik. It's over. <laughs> I've called it. I've thrown the white flag. Um, wow. With your picks last week, you got 10 correct. And because I went opposite on everything, I think I got six or something. So now the total is 141 to 120. 21 pick difference. Listen. With two weeks left, I'm pretty sure that's almost First impossible. of all, I'd like to thank the Academy. I'd like to thank Joey for being such a gracious picks partner throughout this season. We, we, we went with different strategies each week. He's hung in there. I appreciate you, Joey. I, is, I appreciate you. I believe this done. is two years in a row where I've started the year strong and finished. And things have gotten out of hand. Am I, am I the Cowboys of picks? Listen, <laughs> you might be. Yeah, you just might be. It's funny because in my in my pick league, uh, where we actually do it for money and we have picks on the season, I'm actually winning that out of like eight people. So I guess you win some, you lose some. But uh, NFL picks are over. We're just gonna have fun. We're gonna analyze some more games as two year champion wraps up. of picks. I'm uh, we might not, we might need to get a trophy next year. Well, something think. to cement these moments. <laughs> we'll think about it. <laughs> um, all right. The reason Malik is wearing maize and blue today, we got the college yeah. football playoffs coming up. We got big bowl games coming up. I don't know. Where do you want to start? I mean, it's the first game of the day. Yeah. So we might as well just start with it. Okay. And then we can go from there. Yeah. All right. Tell us how you feel. How you feeling? It's been a minute. I am completely split in terms of confidence and feeling uneasy. Mm. I'm completely split. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> because there's no clear there's no clear thing to put Michigan over the top. But I also think there's no clear thing that sets Alabama over Michigan. Michigan was clearly the better team during the regular season. Mm -hmm. Alabama had games where they looked like they just weren't. They were nothing close to what Alabama used to be. Right. But they still have enough talent and made enough plays at times to just get themselves over the hump. They should have lost to Auburn. They almost lost to Arkansas at home, and Arkansas ended up being a 4-8 team. Mm -hmm. This is an Alabama team that has looked flat-out bad multiple times this season. Yep. But when Jalen Milrose is running around, his receivers can get open, and their defense is on point. They can beat almost anybody. And on the perfect day, they went out there and beat Georgia. Mm -hmm. They didn't even play their perfect game. Yeah. And they they beat Georgia because they just they did enough to get it done. Mm -hmm. And because Alabama has those flaws. That's why I have some confidence still in Michigan. Okay. Because it's clear that Jalen Milrow is a very good deep ball thrower. Mm -hmm. He's still not the best short to intermediate thrower. Right. If you let him get out and run around, that's when he really gets in a rhythm. There are teams that have been able to contain that for a good amount of games. And mm -hmm. Alabama's offense has looked bad for stretches. Right. There have been teams that have came in with game plans that were able to exploit Alabama's defense. Mm -hmm. It was shockingly done by Auburn, by a former a former Michigan State quarterback that rushed for almost 100 yards against Alabama, mm -hmm. doing like straight up direct snaps. Yeah. And he was just finding holes and getting first downs and keeping drives going for Auburn. Right. Now, that was an, a rivalry game where you throw out records. Yeah. But Auburn was clearly the lesser team, mm -hmm. and they just kept figuring out how to string out drives. 
J.J. McCarthy, fully healthy, has the ability to make those types of plays, both running and throwing, to just sustain drives, keep drives going six, seven, even like eight minutes long. Mm -hmm. Michigan's defense is experienced enough and good enough to throw things at Jalen Miro to confuse him and to keep Alabama's receivers contained. Michigan has advantages. But Alabama does have five-star talent, and Alabama has Nick Saban, mm -hmm. the greatest coach in college football history. It's, it's an interesting matchup. It really is. A lot of people have just straight up taken Alabama, and I think they really don't even know mo mo <laughs> many of the players, many of the matchups. I yeah. think most of the people that out for, like, like outright from the jump saw the matchup and said, well, Alabama's winning. Right. They see Alabama, what they've done in the past decade and a half. Mm -hmm. And they see what Michigan has been in the past decade and a half. And they're just going with Nick Saban and a lot of five-star and four-star talent. Yeah. When you look at it close up, as I've just said, it's much more complicated than that. This isn't the Alabama of past years. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going more head or more heart, but I'm going Michigan. On the Alabama side, outside of Jalen Milrow, who would you be concerned about? I think Jermaine Burton. He's their deep threat. He's the receiver that pops big plays, whether intermediate intermediate or deep. Um, They have some young receivers that can hit big plays outside of him too. Mm -hmm. but there hasn't been a lot of consistency outside of Jermaine Burton. Jalen Milrow has really been the thing that's been making it all go. Yeah. When he gets into a rhythm, he's hard to stop because the match of his big arm and his athleticism keeps defenses off kilter. Yeah. When he starts running, it puts pressure on the back end, and they don't know whether to go deep or to pay attention to him running around. Yeah. So he'll hit d deep balls. When you try to stop the deep stuff, he can run around. And he's so fast in the open field that a lot of teams, he can break off a 30-yard run within the snap of a finger. Yeah. Like, it, it's it's like nothing to him. And he's so strong that did ankle tackles and, like, tackling him down low, it doesn't work often. Yeah. You have to tackle Jalen Milrow. Mm -hmm. He's too fast and too quick and too strong. Yeah. So Jesse Minter is going to have to call the defensive game of his life. He's going to have to confuse Jalen Milrow every drive mm -hmm. so he doesn't know whether to take off or whether to go deep. You have to keep him in the pocket. Yeah. That is the key for Michigan's defense. Mm -hmm. Keep him in the pocket. Keep him indecisive, not knowing which way to go, when to run, when to pass. Because if you make it easy and he gets open holes to run, that's when the offense gets going. Yeah. And that's where I think you mentioned that he's he's a rhythm guy. When he gets in a rhythm, he's tough to stop. I think that's what Michigan's advantage has always been, though, is that they can slow drives down. They can run the ball, keep yeah. him off the field, and just, like we said, it kind of all Drain season, the like, life out of teams. Right. You just bore them to death almost. Yeah. And you play an old-school, hard-nosed style that just runs them into the ground. Every once in a while, you take some big shots. And you throw them off rhythm. And then if your defense gets enough pressure and things like that, then it's really hard to get going. Um, so I think that's where their advantage is a lot. Um, try to keep, Trying to keep biases out of your mind. Who do you think Alabama would be most afraid of on the Michigan side? Honestly, I think it would be J.J. McCarthy. Michigan's running game has been nowhere near as dominant as it was last year. Yeah, It's still good, but they haven't been able to break off a lot of big running plays. Mm -hmm. Most of that has come through, like you said, those long sustained drives where they wear down defenses right. and then something finally cracks. Mm -hmm. Or it's been through trick plays. This is a game where full trust has to be put into J.J. McCarthy. Mm -hmm. That's on read option plays. That's on play action plays. That's on trick plays. If J.J. is a – he's another guy that 
really needs to get to get into a rhythm mm-hmm. because he hits deep balls when he's going. When he hits like five, six passes in a row, that's when he like rolls out and hit and can hit passes like 30, 40 yards downfield. That's where you can go play action and he can hit like Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson on deep posts. Mm-hmm. You have to get him comfortable and going in both facets of the game, running and passing. Yeah. And the run game has to be more creative. It can't just be the regular run up the middle, run up the middle, run up the middle, then let's try to pass. Yeah. Sharon Moore has to pull out all the stops in the playbook because this Alabama defense stopped Georgia's offense for 80 to 90% of the game. Mm -hmm. They did just enough to get the win. Michigan has to get creative. Yeah. And J.J. has to make good decisions. If you let J.J. run around, he can also make things happen. Yeah. That's a lot of times that's where he's more comfortable when he gets to move around and find open spots in the defense Mm -hmm. and find where things are breaking down. So I think, honestly, J.J. McCarthy is the thing for Alabama to be worried about. Okay. Because yeah, you you let him move around, he can make a lot of plays. Yeah. He can also make mistakes. Mm-hmm. But like I said, fully healthy J.J. McCarthy can also run. So he can he can break out for first downs. Right. And weaken defenses and hit deeper passes when, yeah, when he gets comfortable. Yeah. All right. So both quarterbacks going to be the mainstays for both these teams um, yeah. to figure out how, the, how they want to win. Michigan right now, one and a half point favorites. Um, the ESPN projector thing shows that they're 55% favored. Doesn't mean anything. Um, the over under is 44 and a half, which is kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if I think they would score more than that or less than that. Not sure, but uh, should be a good game. That's on New Year's Day at 5 o'clock. And uh, hoping for the best for you, Malik. Hope they can finally push through and make it to the championship. It's now or never. Yeah. This is the team that Michigan fans hopefully have been waiting for. Mm -hmm. All those juniors came back for their senior years for a reason. Right. This was why. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, either they get it done or it's just more waiting for Michigan. Yeah. But it should be fun. And then the nightcap, the other football playoff. This one could be in the 40s on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be, uh, it could be a lot of points in that game. This game is way. late. It's at 8.45 p.m. for us. And right now, Texas is favored by four and a half. That's, that's a pretty big spread for a college football playoff game. The over-under for this game... <laughs> 63 and a half. (laughs) And that that might be taking it lightly. Yeah. It might be. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised by, like, Texas being that favored in this game? Yes. I I definitely am. It seems odd to me. I honestly would favor Washington just slightly. Right. By maybe, like, one one and a half or two. Yeah, not nothing crazy. There's nothing about Texas that makes them a clear favorite in this game. Mm -hmm. I also think there's nothing about Washington that, Washington, that makes them like a touchdown favorite. Right. These are both teams that play fast, chuck it deep. They both have good run games, but they're primarily the danger is in their passing games. Right. And I will say I think Texas has more playmakers on their defense. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why they have the slight advantage. Yeah. But I'm expecting fireworks. Right. I'm expecting a track meet of a game. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any major advantage in yeah. this game. Texas just has a few more playmakers. Their D-line is probably more physical. Right. But listen, Washington has the high, has Michael Penix. Yeah. Michael Penix has three NFL caliber receivers with him. Mm-hmm. Quinn Ewers has NFL caliber re- receivers with him. Yeah. It's, it's, there's just offensive talent all over the place. Yeah. And I know it's been a couple of weeks, but – Washington definitely had the tougher schedule going down the stretch. Texas hasn't played anybody crazy in months. Yeah, they they have the best win of the season. Yeah, winning beating Alabama on right. the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I don't know this. This could be like you said. It could, this could be fireworks, which I'm kind of hoping for, especially 
if uh, that first game is kind of slow and, you know, methodical between Alabama and Michigan, at least if Michigan's winning, I would assume. Um, I would love to see fireworks in this game. That would be fun. I don't really, I'm not really pulling for any team. I kind of like both of the teams in this game. So I don't know if I care who wins, but uh, I think I would favor Washington just a little bit. Um, but that's me. So. I, I would also favor Washington just slightly because I, I trust Michael Penix just a little bit more than Quinn Ewers. Yeah. Like we, Quinn Ewers has had some really good games. He's also had some games where it looked like he still had a lot of steps to take as a quarterback. Right. Now, uh, Michael Penix has also had a few down games, but like you said, the strength of schedule was a bit higher. Mm -hmm. Like playing on the road at Oregon State was tough. Yeah. Playing Oregon was tough. Right. He had to play them twice. Mm -hmm. He didn't he did have many easy games. Yeah. That absolute insane game they played against USC wasn't easy. They won like 56 to like 48. Yeah. Yeah, Michael Penix had to play some tough teams and he came out in in the end. Yeah. And yeah, just 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 slightly favor Washington just because I like Michael Penix a little bit more. Yeah. So our, our two college football playoff games should be exciting, should be fun. Uh, but what other bowl games are you looking for? There's games going on right now. There's games tomorrow. They kind of ramp up as the week goes on. I think for me, I'm probably going to tune in to that Missouri-Ohio State game on Friday night. Like that That's one that I'm definitely looking forward to. Yeah, Because that should be fun. Missouri had a really good season. Um, and they're going to play against Ohio State, who, you know, was one win away from making a college football playoff. So yeah, I, I think there, there are little storylines in a lot of these games coming up mm -hmm. that I find interesting. Like just, just as a personal college football fan thing, SMU and both is coming to the ACC next year. A lot of people don't know that mm -hmm. SMU and Boston college is a preview of a future ACC game. Yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, Arizona, Oklahoma, Arizona is ranked 14th. They're nine and three. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, they almost, I think they only won one game a few years ago, and Jed Fish has turned them around quickly. They have one of the better young quarterbacks in the country and a wide receiver that everybody needs to look out for. Ted Aroa McMillan, they call him, they call him T-Mac. Hmm. He's 6'5", 210. This year he's had 80 catches for over 1,200 yards and 10 touchdowns. Nice. My comp for him is Mike Evans. Like, yeah. he, he's big. He can move. He has great hands, and he can run every route. Hmm. Ted Aroa McMillan is a beast of a receiver that everybody needs to check out for. So that Arizona Oklahoma game should there should be a lot of points in that one. Missouri Ohio State, yeah, I, I can't wait to watch that game. I yeah. hope Missouri beats Ohio State. <laughs> I really hope they do. Yeah. Uh, Georgia Florida State, I don't know who's playing in that game. Yeah. <laughs> that game is going to be a weird one. I have no idea who's playing in it. Right. Uh, Tennessee isn't starting Joe Milton. They're starting their highly touted five-star uh, quarterback, Nico Iamalieva. He's making his first start. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, interesting stories from several yeah. games. Liberty and Oregon, kind of interesting just because. A lot of, not... a lot of Oregon fans are upset that they got to play Liberty, but Liberty yeah. Liberty went 13-0 and 0 mm -hmm. and had a really good season. So got to give them something. They got, yeah, every team, uh, a certain team, Every year, a certain team is going to get that New Year's Six spot. Right. And Liberty deserved it this year. Yeah. And Bo, Bo Nix, I wouldn't imagine him playing, right? He might. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that he's sitting out. I'm going to say it. It's this, hard to This would probably be his those. last game. Yeah. So, I'd, he might just play. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Um. Do, so, then... Would you say that, that Missouri-Ohio State is probably the, the one you're most excited for outside of the top four? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that. Uh, Arizona, Oklahoma, okay. those, those two are up there. Yeah. A any interest in Ole Miss-Penn State? I, Ole Miss's offense is exciting. Yeah. I have no idea what to, what Penn State is going to do, mm -hmm. but I, I like Ole Miss's offense a lot, so that should be a fun game yeah. to watch. All righty. Was there any – did you watch any of the lead-up bowl games like this past week? Uh, I have. 
The only thing I saw was Minnesota winning, which was kind of fun. It, it was a weird game. Minnesota was five and seven, mm-hmm. but there there was some cool stories. They're starting running back Darius Taylor was from Detroit, went to Wald Lake Western. Mm, okay, he had thirty five carries for like two hundred five yards. Dang, he's their like next really good running back. Okay. Only a true freshman, he's really good. Yeah, uh, the Kansas UNLV game was a ton of fun. J- Jason Bean threw for four forty nine and six touchdowns. Yeah. Yeah, Kansas had two wide receivers go for over five, four catches, like 160 yards and three touchdowns. Mm-hmm. First nine win season for Kansas. Yeah. Since 2008. And they like one of their best seasons in school history. Yeah. I know it was a little lackluster because it was Bryson Barnes that started, but Northwestern getting a bowl win is fun. Listen, man. David Braun, I'm so happy for him. He, yeah, he, he did something nobody expected at yeah. all. Yeah. Uh, the other really fun one, Rocky Lombardi getting his his bowl win. <laughs> final playoff, um, not playoff, final college football game. Let's hope yeah. to the football gods that Rocky Lombardi, this was his final game. I think he had, uh, man. I like just looked at it. He had like 200 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions. Uh, what, what else do you expect from him? He yeah. used to go into wrestling or something. He has the look of like a WWE wrestler. The other disappointing end to a season is James Madison. Losing in their bowl game to Air Force. Yeah. That was that was brutal. But um it is what it is, I guess. So yeah. Got some big bowl games coming up this week. Um you got any big uh, New Year's plans, Malik? Uh honestly just watching yeah, fo- meeting up with some other Michigan fans and watching the game at a friend's house. Yeah. Don't and go too crazy on New Year's Eve. You gotta be able to wake up by five. Listen, man. <laughs> I I might go home if Michigan loses, if Michigan wins, it it might be a long night. Might take the day a off. A long night of partying. The next day. Listen, <laughs> I I'm I'm off until January eighth. Oh, working in oh, the school. Right. Yeah, yes. the schools are out. Two I, weeks I forgot off. their schedule is different. Yeah. Yes. Enjoying okay. this break every go day. Go for it. Yep. Go <laughs> so, go ahead. Listen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here for everything. I'm here for everything. All righty. Um, I think that's about it. Um, I hope everybody had a a Merry Christmas, and uh, we'll see you in the new year as we review the Lions and Michigan maybe moving on. We'll see. See you next time. The Wizards are moving to Virginia. The Pistons, just just think about relocating. I I, I don't don't think we need that much anymore. This is going to be a controversial take. We got to talk about this with Chris. Move the pistons. <laughs>